Uh, today's passage tells a story uh, of God ordering the people of Israel uh, to be circumcised when they arrive at a place called Gilgal. Uh, we will discuss essential lessons uh, from today's text this week and the following week. Uh, this week I'll be preaching on the lessons from today's text and next week um, I am looking forward to sharing with you um, a message titled The Meaning of Circumcision and Baptism. Well, according to our passage, the people of Israel crossed the Jordan through the miracle of God. Their crossing took place near Jericho, uh, but they were able to head to Gilgal, and they were able to camp there without opposition uh, from the soldiers or the people of Canaan. And although Gilgal was located on the boundary of Canaan, it was still part of the promised land, and it will serve as a headquarters for the upcoming conquest. And it was here that God commanded the people of Israel to be circumcised. And this story teaches us three important lessons. The first lesson, if you'd like to repeat after me, trust in God. Trust in God. The people of Israel were now in the enemy camp. Gilgal, where they were camped, was not very far from Jericho. And the thing about Jericho was that it was known to be an impenetrable fortress that had been standing there for 5,000 years and in over, overcoming enemy invasions for that long. But it was at this place, as they were getting ready to conquer Jericho, that God ordered Joshua to circumcise the Israelites. Well, first of all, what is circumcision? It is a removal of the foreskin of males. And this caused great suffering to those who were circumcised. You know, there is a story in the Bible that explains this well. In Genesis chapter 34, verse 1 through 35, we read a story about Dinah. Um, she's one of Jacob's daughters. She was sexually violated by a man named Shechem. He was a son of Hamor, and he was also the ruler in that area. After finding out what had happened, Hamer went out to talk with Jacob to let Dinah become Shechem's wife. Hamer also asked Jacob to let his people intermarry with their people. And if Jacob agreed, they said they would allow Jacob to purchase land from them and they would settle in the land with them. Well, upon hearing that Dinah had been violated by Shechem, Dinah's brothers were angry and they were determined to take revenge. And before his father Jacob had decided on Hamer's offer, Jacob's sons deceived Shechem and Hamor, saying that they would give Dinah for marriage under one condition. The condition was that all their men would have to be circumcised before giving Dinah to them. And Hamer and Shechem agreed and circumcised every man in the city. Let's read what happens in Genesis chapter 34, verse 25. Let's read it together. Three days later, while all of them were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and attacked the unsuspecting city, killing every male. What does this mean? When the men in the city were in severe pain on the third day, just the two of Jacob's sons, just Simeon and Levi, they raided and killed all the unsuspecting men with their swords. Yes, as you can see, circumcision involves a great deal of pain. You know, those circumcised were in so much pain that they could not defend themselves while Simeon and Levi Protect them. In other words, it wasn't easy to be circumcised as recorded and as commanded in Joshua chapter 5. It could endanger the whole army of Israel. And it was also crazy to be circumcised near the enemy camp during the war. Circumcision meant the end of people's ability to fight. But God commanded Joshua and the men of Israel to be circumcised at that point and at that location. 
And at that time, well, did God not realize the dangerous situation they were in? Of course, he did. Because we know and we believe that God is all-knowing. Nevertheless, God said that circumcision should be performed here and now. Why is that? Why here and now? Before fighting and before their conquest of Jericho. It is because God wanted the Israelites to trust God absolutely. It is because God wanted Israel to only trust in God. The conquest of Canaan may seem easy if you look at the size of the army of Israel. According to Book of Numbers, the number of men over 20 capable of fighting numbered about 600,000, 3,550 men. That's quite a military force. And with this kind of military force, it would have been easy for the people of Israel to rely only on their strength and not God. So during this time, God made Israelites lay down everything by submitting to circumcision. You know, God was teaching them not to rely on their strength. And God wanted his people to only look to him. So God was leading them to trust in him. Because the war belongs to God. God wanted, people, God wanted Israel to know that Canaan would be conquered through God's power. Let's look at 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 20, verse 15. It says, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because, because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. That's right. The war belongs to God. They must rely on God's power and wisdom in order for them to win the war. You see, God had already had a plan for the people of Israel from the beginning. Joshua chapter 5, verse 1 testifies. It says, Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted in fear, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. This is why God made the Israelites cross the Jordan River during the flood. Now, God's plan was to prevent the inhabitants of Jericho and Canaan from attacking Israel as they entered the Promised Land. Having the Israelites cross the Jordan River you know, was not a coincidence. One thing that we can learn from our passage today is that the obedience is testament to one's trust. The people of Israel obeyed God's command to circumcise. You know, they did not complain. They did not say to God, God, I think this is a bad time for that right now. Or, God, maybe we can do that after the war. Or perhaps, God, we should only circumcise maybe half of the men so they can fight. Or maybe perhaps just the children. But there were no compromise for the people of God. All the males were circumcised as God commanded because they trusted God. That's right. Obedience is proof we have faith in the one that commands us. Amen? You know, if we say we believe in God a thousand times, but if we don't trust him, obedience is impossible. Living according to the word of God, keeping the Sabbath day holy is only possible when we trust in God. Tithing during this economic downturn is only possible if we trust in God. And the same goes for becoming part of the Global Methodist Church, even though the future of Global Methodist Church is unclear. To live according to the Word of God, 
we will find that we will often become vulnerable. And we may suffer a loss in order to do so. And it may also seem foolish, and we may feel like we will get the short end of the stick, but in order for us to obey God, we have to trust in God. When we trust in God, we know that we are in good hands. Friends, I pray that we will have absolute faith in God. Amen? And I hope that we remember that the God who speaks to us is almighty and all-knowing, and God is infinitely wise, and he will take responsibility for everything in our lives when we trust him. The second lesson that we can learn from our passage today, if you'd like to repeat after me, do first things first. Do first things first. The people of Israel who crossed the Jordan River and who entered the Promised Land, you know, they were full of fighting spirit. You know, they wanted to begin the conquest. You know, but God commanded Joshua and the Israelites to be circumcised while they were still eager to fight. You know, there is a lesson that we can learn from this. You know, what we consider a priority may not be what God thinks is the first priority. And what we value the most may not be what God values the most. The urgent thing for the people of Israel was to wage war against their enemies, and they were hoping for a quick conquest, but in God's eyes, it was circumcision. That was the first priority and most important. It was because circumcision symbolized the relationship between God and Israel. And because it was also the sign of God's covenant with Israel. Well, the same is true for our spiritual lives. The truth is that our priority may not be God's priority in our lives. And there is a possibility that we neglect what God considers important. Let me give you some examples. You know, many Christians, sadly, live this way. You know, many Christians would rather pursue worldly comfort than to prepare for eternal life. There are those whose life plan takes precedence over God's will. Some place more urgency in taking care of one's business than worshiping and obeying God. And many people also spend great energy on physical fitness, but not their spiritual wellness. And many seek only the pleasures the world offers rather than the eternal joy and satisfaction that we receive from God. And many neglect their relationship with God under the pretext of being busy. These things happen when we do not realize what comes first and what is important. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying one's dream and vision and health and our business, I'm not saying that they are not important. And I'm not saying that we should give up our lives entirely. I am saying that we must focus on what God considers vital, important, as we live and go through life. So what are our life's first priorities and importance in God's eyes? Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Let's read it together. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That's right. Seeking God's kingdom and glorifying God is more important than anything else. Amen? Jesus reminds us that our spiritual, spiritual labor should come before our physical labor. Why is that? It's because our labor for God is the most important and valuable task that we have been entrusted by God. The scripture tells us that we are ambassadors for Christ. That means we are on a mission for God. And this, the world that we live in right now, is not our home. So what's the most important thing? The 
Bible says the most important thing is seeking God first. That means knowing what God wants and doing God's work. It means living for God's kingdom and his glory. It is about being an ambassador for Christ while we are on earth. So our relationship with God will determine what kind of work we will do in this life. Jesus also lived as a pilgrim who did not belong to this world. He lived for what was important to God. The disciples of Jesus, Apostle Paul, and many ancestors of faith live to obey and please God. And there are many people regarded them as fools. But Bible says they were wise. Because it is truly wise to know God and live to please God. Amen? Therefore, we should live today as the scripture teaches us. That means we have to focus on what God says is important. We have to live as ambassadors on a mission. Pastor Urban W. Lutzer wrote a book called Pastor to Pastor. Pastor Lutzer shares an interesting illustration. A man wanted to know how to carve an elephant. So he went to a famous sculpture, sculptor. And when asked, the famous sculptor replied, you pick up a block of marble and chisel away all the parts that don't look like elephant. We must take the block of our time and life. And we must leave the essential parts on and boldly remove the unnecessary parts. That means making first things first. Dear friends, I pray and hope that we live by doing the most important things first. Amen? You know, that means living according to what God wants for our lives as revealed to us by the scripture. And the third lesson for for us this morning, if you'd like to after, repeat after me, cast away your old ways. Cast away your old ways. You know, here is the fundamental reason why God commanded Israelites to be circumcised. From our reading today, it says God commanded them to be circumcised because the first generation of Israelites who had already been circumcised you know, died in the wilderness due to their disobedience. So the next generation entering the promised land was born in the wilderness, and they were not yet circumcised. But there is also a deeper reason. From our reading today in Joshua chapter 5, verse 9. <clears throat> Let's read it together. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, so the place has been called Gilgal, to this day. The reason was to roll away or take away the disgrace and shame of Egypt. You know, God did not want the Israelites to enter the promised land with the shame of Egypt on them. In other words, it was to take away their shame and disgrace. What does the disgrace of Egypt mean? It was a disgrace, disgrace of the first generation and their old way of living as Egyptian slaves. It points to the fact that Israelites did not give up their sinful ways after they were delivered from Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. By submitting to the rite of circumcision, the new generation renewed their commitment to God, and they rolled away the shame and disgrace of Egypt. We know that from our readings that the people of Israel worshipped idols like the Egyptians while they were slaves in Egypt. And they suffered greatly and they complained a lot. And this was not what God had in mind for his redeemed people. The people of Israel did not abandon their old ways while they were headed to promised land. And we have many evidence of that. There's evidence of the golden calf incident 
Also, people complained in Mara. And people distrusted God after hearing the negative report from 10 spies sent to spy on the land. So it was God's plan and God's desire that he did not want the people of Israel to enter the promised land with such disgrace. And this is why God commanded Joshua to circumcise the people. And this is also why the people called the place Gilgal. The name Gilgal means to roll away, to let go. You know, God wanted the people of Israel to enter the promised land clothed in holiness. And God wanted them to live differently, set apart from those who lived in Canaan. So likewise, God wants all of us to live out our faith in a changed way. God wants us to throw away our old ways. It means God wants us to cast away our anger, hatred, envy, jealousy, complaints, quarrels, and doubts. It also means abandoning everything we trust more than God. God wants to cut away the sinful and disobedient parts of our lives. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21, it says, let's read that together. Oops. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, all those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. What the scripture teaches us is that God does not want to fill God's kingdom and his church with those who live according to the flesh. But God wants all of us to serve God wholeheartedly and grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And I pray that our thoughts and actions are made anew daily through the Holy Spirit's power according to God's will. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, he says this. Let's read it together. <clears throat> but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. I sincerely hope that we will serve God and his church by bearing the fruit of the Spirit. And let us fix our eyes on the kingdom of God. Dear friends, God wants us to rely on him and trust him as we read in our passage today. Obedience is our testament to our trust in God. You know, without obedience to God's word, you know, we cannot say we trust and rely on God. And I also pray that we will focus on what God considers important in our lives. Remember that what we consider important may not be the most important thing to God. And I also pray that we remember that we are on, we are on earth as God's ambassadors. And that we will not forget our mission, which is to glorify God and advance his kingdom. And lastly, I pray that we will put on our new self in Christ and cast away our old self. I sincerely hope and pray that all of us in New Gate live a spirit-filled life and grow in the likeness to Jesus Christ each day. Amen. Let's pray.